From Brennan to the Boca Chill, from Lamy to La Push, and from the lordly Salda to lovely Duckabush. From Samish to Sammamish, Suquamish to Quillacine, the climate is so friendly, it's a land that's evergreen. Hello, and welcome to the History of the Evergreen State podcast. I'm your host, John C., and thank you for joining me today for episode 78, Molt Taylor and the Arrow Car. Molt, Molten Burnell Taylor, was born in Portland, Oregon to William Albert, known as Bert, and Kate Taylor on the 29th of September, 1912, and he grew up in Longview and Kelso in Cowlitz County. He began building model airplanes as a child and received his pilot's license at the age of 16. He obtained a business degree from the University of Washington after graduating from R.A. Long High School in Longview in 1930. Molt Taylor enlisted in the United States Navy's Aviation Cadet Program in 1936, and he ended up attending flight school in Pensacola, Florida. He flew biplane trainers for 14 months before joining the USS Quincy for three years of active duty. He met Lillian Verniel Gregory, who went by the moniker Neil, during a New Year's Eve celebration, and the two ended up marrying in 1939. They launched a business selling Luscombe and Culver airplanes since they had a passion for aviation. Neil was also a pilot. Molt Taylor designed the Taylor Airphone in the late 1930s, which was a portable battery-powered navigational system that was affordable enough for small plane owners to buy. When the Second World War broke out, the Navy called Taylor back and he rose through the ranks to that of a commander with the title of Officer in Charge of Pilotless Aircraft Development. Taylor used a new technology called television to guide the first surface-to-surface missile to its target in 1942. As a result of his work on this project, he received the Legion of Merit Honor. Commander Taylor was pushed by the Navy to pursue a career in weapons research, but he declined. He subsequently explained that, I just decided not to spend the rest of my life inventing tools to kill people. I admit it, I'm an idealist. Taylor worked for a firm in Cleveland, Ohio after the war, which sought to transport airmail by pilotless aircraft, but the project was way ahead of its time and never took off. Taylor began designing the Duckling, a small amphibious aircraft, in 1944, but it was never put into production. He came up with the concept of a flying car after considering different aircraft designs. It had such a flawless, symmetrical logic to it. It would be successful. There's no doubt about that. Of course, this would necessitate money, which Taylor lacked in abundance. Moult's father, Bert Taylor, urged the couple to return to Longview and offered to assist them in finding investors so that Moult could pursue his goal. Taylor met Robert E. Fulton Jr., who had designed a flying car dubbed the Airphibian, about this time. Molt's curiosity in this type of aircraft was awakened once more. When the Ducklings' production went through, the Taylors relocated from suburban Philadelphia to the Evergreen State, where Bert had found them a home. The impassioned journey that would last the rest of Molt's life began now, the development of a flying car. A flying car just made sense for Taylor, both in terms of time and convenience. Molt reasoned that the trouble with airplanes is that they never carry you where you want to go. Instead, they take you to an airport. They left when they wanted to, not when you wanted to, unless you happen to own an airplane, but even then you are left to the whims and rules of when you can fly and when you can't. He persuaded 50 investors from around Longview to pay $1,000 each so that he could begin designing the aero car, relying on his personality and salesmanship. He began to work on it in 1947, having built a modern-looking facility near the Kelso Airfield, located just west of the Cowlitz River. Some of the aerocar's advantages were highlighted in an early brochure, which was printed before the vehicle's first public flight. Your aerocar can be kept in the garage at home, obviating the need for a hangar. You may get into your aerocar right outside your door and fly to your destination, safe in the knowledge that you'll be able to return home regardless of the weather, and you'll have all the conveniences of your car when you get there. Private flying's terminal constraints and unpredictability could now be forgotten. The Airphibian, designed by Robert Fulton Jr., had fixed, detachable wings, but Molt Taylor noticed the flaws in that design right away. His prototype had wings and a tail that could be folded back for storage or completely disassembled and hauled like a trailer to be reattached at a different landing strip. He explored adding a rotating wing, similar to a helicopter, to provide lift, but he determined that permanently attached rotors would be a safety danger on the roads. Taylor originally developed a quarter-scale model, which he tested in the University of Washington's state-of-the-art wind tunnel. 
The car component of the craft was finished by June of 1949, and the strange-looking vehicle became a common sight on the streets of Longview and Kelso. Moving effortlessly between two means of transportation was a top priority for the designer from the start. Malt Taylor later noted that a woman in high heels can make the transition from plane to car. The entire process took around 15 minutes, and the engine wouldn't start until every connection was completed properly, which was an ingenious safety precaution. The aero car had a wingspan of 30 feet and a length of 21 feet, side-by-side -side seating for two people, hydraulic brakes, and a single air-cooled 143-horsepower Lycoming engine positioned over the rear wheels. The vehicle's outside panels were made of fiberglass to reduce weight, and the same steering wheel was used to fly and drive. It had a top speed of 100 miles per hour and a takeoff speed of 55. An aerocar's pre-production cost was estimated to be three to four thousand dollars, but after a few production vehicles were made, the price had climbed to twenty-five thousand. Malt Taylor's flying car was unveiled at precisely the perfect time after the nation had been energized by a mood of enormous optimism and positive energy following the Second World War. Aerocar investors in the area, doctors, teachers, and business people, put their money into what they anticipated would be a technical masterpiece. The aero car was ready for its first flight on the 8th of December 1949. The field was lined with Taylor's supporters. The initial flight went successfully, and the aero car was quickly dubbed future transportation by the media. Taylor began displaying his new machine at Aaron Auto events across the country, including a 1950 visit at the Portland Livestock Exposition. The odd-looking car plane, which resembled a four-wheeled lemon drop, was a media attraction, with newspapers, magazines, and newsreels covering every flight extensively. The Army Field Forces invited Taylor and the aero car to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in 1951 to be further evaluated. Molt Taylor was also invited to test Robert Fulton and his Airphibian, which had initially caught his interest. Taylor was ecstatic about the trip's prospects, as evidenced by a letter he wrote to his shareholders, in which he said, This is truly our big chance. The Army is almost certain to purchase some machines for additional testing. Of course, no one knows how many there are. We can only hope that it reaches the hundreds. Although 14 pilots tested the aero car at Fort Bragg and gave it excellent feedback, the Army eventually chose helicopters as its preferred mode of personnel transport and deployment. Unfazed, Molt Taylor persuaded General Petroleum Corporation to fund a West Coast tour that culminated in Los Angeles at Motorama, the country's largest automobile, aircraft, and boat exhibition, where 100,000 people marveled at his bizarre creation. Molt Taylor tweaked and tested his aero car concept until the first production vehicle was ready in 1954. One of the stockholders present at the meeting following the demonstration flight was so impressed that he purchased an additional $1,300 worth of stock right then and there, saying he hoped that every stockholder would do the same. Not only for those who created the machines, but also for those who contributed money, these were surely very thrilling times indeed. He sold three hand-built trial prototypes for $15,000 each, intending to use the proceeds to prepare the aero car for mass production, but no aircraft or automobile companies expressed any interest. The aero car's publicity campaign continued on full scale, however. Malt Taylor appeared on the popular TV show I've Got a Secret in 1959, telling host Gary Moore that he had flown in front of the studio audience in an automobile parked on the stage. The Bob Cummings show's opening sequences featured views of a soaring aero car. For numerous years, KISN, a Portland radio station, flew an aero car over the city, reporting traffic updates in quite possibly one of the most whimsical ways known to man. Kudos to them. Greg Gilbert, a 19-year-old photographer for the Seattle Times, flew over Longview in the aero car with Taylor at the controls in the mid-1960s. Gilbert recalled that the aero car was very claustrophobic, smaller than a Volkswagen Beetle, and quite noisy. It took off swiftly and felt sturdy in the air, not shaky at all. Molt Taylor felt his production troubles were over when the aero car was certified by federal aviation authorities in 1956. At one point, he had 278 dealers around the country place orders for flying cars that would never be built, each paying $1,000 down. A deal to build the aero car with Ling Temco in Texas suddenly fell through. The corporation abruptly notified him that the funds required to set up the factory were no longer available. Even before the facility was ready for production, the sales organization designed to promote and ease aero car sales had squandered it. Taylor was extremely anguished as he watched his greatest chance vanish. 
Taylor updated the Aero car in 1970 to make it more powerful and sleeker. The new design piqued the Ford Motor Company's interest, and company president Lee Lakocha commissioned a feasibility study to determine its commercial potential. Sales might reach 25000 per year, according to the research. However, because federal officials were concerned about tens of thousands of commuters flying in private planes, Ford executives felt that large production was just not feasible. Not only were automakers dealing with the 1970s oil crisis, but foreign automobiles were also flooding the market and harsher pollution restrictions were being implemented. The engineers stated that complying with new federal automobile safety requirements would add so much extra heft to the aero car that it would be unable to fly, reigniting the weight versus efficiency debate that has dogged flying cars since their very first inception. Molt Taylor had yet to land a manufacturing deal after 25 years, but he never wavered in his belief in the future of flying automobiles. In an interview with the Longview Daily News in 1988, he stated, You can have freeways in the air. You're going to fill the goddamn sky with autos eventually. It just has to take place. Molt continued to tinker with his invention well into the early 1990s when he was in his 80s. Taylor, now in poor health, was determined to make one final stab at the mass market. A Texas promoter, an Arizona flight engineer, and the heir to a timber fortune who still pilots one of Taylor's initial vehicles are among those who had converted to his Aerocar 4 design. Only a few Aerocars were ever produced, with estimates ranging from 5 to 7 depending on whether prototypes and commercial versions are included. The Experimental Aircraft Association's Aviation Museum in Oshkosh, Wisconsin has one Aerocar on exhibit, which is a 1949 repaired prototype. Seattle's incredible Museum of Flight owns another Aerocar, a later variant known as the Aerocar 3. Marilyn Felling, the owner of an Aerocar, sold it for $3.5 million in 2006. A few years later, in 2013, another Aerocar with an estimated value of 600,000 British pounds, about a million US dollars, was put up for sale. There are no records of this sale, though. Molt Taylor passed away in Longview on the 16th of November 1995 and is buried there. He was inducted into the Experimental Aircraft Association's Hall of Fame at Oshkosh shortly before his death, and he would also be inducted into the Aviation Hall of Fame in Washington, D.C. in 2001. Molt Taylor was an excellent guy, according to Larry Adams, the airport manager in Walla Walla and a member of the Hall of Fame nomination committee. He was one of those individuals that shared his love of flying, knowing Molt benefited a lot of individuals, not only in the Evergreen State, but all over the world. The Kelso Longview Regional Airport was known as Molt Taylor Field until 2009 to honor his tireless efforts of putting Longview on the aviation map. It has since been renamed the Southwest Washington Regional Airport, but in my opinion, they should change it back because not enough local and good people are honored in the Evergreen State. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a 5-star review and don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss a new episode. Doing so really helps the show to grow and to expand its audience, so any help that you can give in that regard will be greatly appreciated. Sources for this episode include A Drive in the Clouds, The Story of the Aero Car by Jake Schultz, The Los Angeles Times, The Longview Daily News, The Seattle Times, HistoryLink.org, The New York Times, and Flying Cars, The True Story by Andrew Glass. Thank you for listening to episode 78, Molt Taylor and the Aero Car. Episode 79 will be released next week. A special thanks goes out to Al Hirsch for providing the music for the podcast. If you have any questions about the show, please contact History of the Evergreen State Pod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to another episode of the History of the Evergreen State Podcast. And until next time, I'm your host, John C. There's peace on the Skokomish, on the Queets and on the Hull. There's calm on the Nisqually, born of ageless ice and snow. A land that nature loves so much, she stays the whole year round. I trade a royal palace for a shack on Puget Sound. There's Chimicum and Stillicum, where spouts the gooey duck. The singing still a Guamish and the swirling skookum chuck and Moclips and Copalis where the razor clams abound. A little bit of heaven is a shack on Puget Sound. A little bit of heaven 
is a shock on Puget Sound.